We've got a ring in. We do. <laughs> okay, Raph, say hi to everyone. Meow. Let me go is what he's saying. <laughs> if you follow the Facebook page, you would have seen a photo of a young Master Raph with Felix, the toy kickabo, um, <laughs> last week, I think, oh, at some point. we love our cat. He doesn't we love that love, though. No, he, no, he does. He loves his pets. <laughs> and now he's sniffing the microphone. <laughs> Meow. The what? The history cat? Yes. <laughs> oh. Okay. No. All right. Okay. I'll what was your you cat? Is that <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, Raph. Thank you for keeping my seat warm. Literally. Yep. Thank you. Off you go. Maybe, but. Thank you. You may go now. Auditions done. Go on. <laughs> Auditions for mascots. Keep off. <laughs> got... Oh, Raph. The creaking door is going to sound great on the podcast. Oh, goodness. Oh, just close the door. Okay, oh. fine. You want to sit down there? That's okay. You trap for me now. No with problem. I don't think he's got the temperament for podcasting. No, I don't think he has the patience. Oh, well. we <laughs> Lucky we try. do. We Lucky do. we do. <laughs> so I think after that little distraction, we should probably get on with it, shall yes, we? Yes, we shall. <gasps> what the? History. 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 Hello and welcome to the What the History podcast. The podcast that has bits of history that will make you say What the History. I what am was tre- that morsel? <laughs> that too. Sorry. I am Trevor Holland and I am joined by... Susie Holland, who is always interrupting, apparently. No, yeah, that happens. And giggling. And bumping the desk. And, and bumping the it. desk. Oh, and rubbing it. Look, I'm rubbing it. Yeah, you're, you're, Trevor. You were rubbing the desk the other week and it came through on the recording. Sorry. Yeah. I, I try to be professional. That was that weird sound. But I just touched the... Right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it looks shiny. <laughs> Oh, dear. So, what wondrous, bizarre bit of history do you have for us this evening, Susie? Oh, I've got a um, an interesting little story of history because we're celebrating the World Cup at the moment. Yay! Yeah. Yay, sports ball. Sports ball. <laughs> As we are in the throes of the football or soccer, depending on where you're from, World Cup 2018 currently being held in Moscow, I thought I would research what happened at the World Cup in 1938, which was held in France. And an interesting year that was. So tune into the happenings in 1938 and set your faces to say, what the? <laughs> To avoid any political brouhaha to mar their World Cup, officials had decided to have it in a neutral country, hence why they chose France, which was also the birthplace of the Fédération Internationale de Football Association, or FIFA for short. I think I prefer FIFA. Um, The Federation also decided to make use of France's location so other European teams didn't have to travel so far and they wouldn't be deterred as they were in 1930 for the first World Cup in Uruguay. The big plus about France was that they didn't want to repeat at the 1936 Olympics in Berlin where Hitler and the Nazi Party had used propaganda to bolster the Olympics, promoting Germany as a strong peaceful, tolerant, new and united country while targeting the Romani and Jews away from the cameras, celebrating their return to the world arena after being defeated in the First World War. Now, in 1934, Mussolini had done the same thing with the Italian-hosted World Cup and used the sacred sport as a political platform. Speaking of Mussolini, he apparently also sent the Italian team in 1938 a telegram that said, Win or die, with Hungarian goalkeeper Antol Sarsbo, oh, Sharbo, I can't pronounce his name, I'm really sorry, uh, quipping after the game, I may have let in four goals, but I, at least I saved their lives. But still in 1938, with eyes turned on to France, onlookers were greeted with the notable absenteeism of England, Argentina, Spain and Uruguay. It was the first World Cup to use numbers on the backs of players and also, like Eurovision, yay, the first time that the host nation qualified automatically. Ernst Lotscher 
of Switzerland became the first player to be officially credited with an own goal playing against Germany. Which might have not, been not uh, something so you would good be for famous him. for, no. <laughs> <laughs> Leonidas from Brazil scored the Adidas or Adidas Golden Boot with seven goals, while the shorts of Giuseppe Miazza, the captain for Italy, fell down after he scored a penalty in the semi final, and in true sportsman style, he took the kick with one hand holding them up, leading his team to eventual victory when they beat Hungary in the finals with the final score being four to two. I wonder if they fell down again when Italy won. <laughs> or after Italy Or won. after Italy won. <laughs> Yay! Argentina believed fully and loudly that they should have been awarded the host country rights due to alternation between South America and Europe, and then they decided they didn't want to have anything to do with it after France got the nod. They did, however, submit a late entry and then withdrew, causing protests outside the Argentinian FA offices. Uruguay decided they didn't want to travel to France, leaving Brazil as the only South American representatives coming in at a respectable third in the final standings. Spain was sadly forced to withdraw from competition due to the Spanish Civil War, which was occurring at the time, and the other team that was unfortunately absent was Austria. Prior to the 1938's World Cup, the Austrian team was known as their wonder team, having an unbroken streak of winning 14 games in the earlier parts of the 1930s, and won the silver medal at the 1936 Berlin Olympic Games. They came fourth at the 1934 World Cup in Italy, and Austria happily entered the Wonder Team in the 1938, expecting great things from the team. However, due to the annexation of Austria by Nazi Germany in March 1938, Austria ceased to exist as a country, and it was now part of Germany. This was known as the Anschluss and paved the way for a greater, more horrible Nazi presence in Austria leading to further persecution. What this meant for the Wonder Team was to withdraw, though some players ended up playing for Germany, even after the Wonder Team played their first qualifying game against Latvia before withdrawal. This opened up a space for another team to join the competition, and FIFA offered this place to England, and England said thanks, but no thanks. By this time, there are only 15 teams in the tournament, and it was going to be the last World Cup for 12 years. So when you football enthusiasts out there, yes, I am one of them, and you watch the games of the noble sport, spare a thought for the pioneers of 80 years ago in a hearty what the. What the indeed. indeed. Yeah. I, I mean, it would be terrible to have to pull out of right, a World Cup because your country stopped existing. That's just awful. Whew. That's just, I mean, I don't like to bring my political thoughts onto our podcast because it's meant to be light and funny, but sometimes we come across things that aren't so nice. And yeah, I really don't like Nazis. I think we can all agree that Nazis suck. Nazis do suck. And what they did to Austria was in 1938, that that almost brings me to tears. Well, I'm actually not happy right now. Um... (laughs) Yeah, not impressed at Nazi Germany, put it that way. No. And I'll just start. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, it, yeah, it's horrible. And, you know, and Hitler loved this sort of thing. He loved the annexation between Austria and Germany because he was Austrian and he thought he was joining the two countries together when, you know, you can't do that, Hitler, okay? You fool. <laughs> yeah, great numpty. <laughs> Yeah. Over to you, Trev. He's got all the personality of a pigeon, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> oh, that's insulting to pigeons. Well, really insulting to pigeons. And this is no way to do a segue. <laughs> <laughs> no way whatsoever. Uh, I had to work with something that... Oh, <laughs> from what you gave I'm, me. I'm sorry, guys. I didn't mean to get all emotional and stuff. But, yeah, I really, really, really don't like Nazis after what they did to so many people. And uh, they... Just, they're just horrible, okay? To me, they're horrible. Okay. Well, in a way, this does touch on plans to <laughs> fight them in mine. Uh, yes. It does. Yeah. You know, this pandemic conversation. But there we go. <laughs> you tell them. I'm just going to get started. All right. Oh, sorry, God. I haven't been that emotional since the Happy Warriors. Oh, dear. 
Oh, that was a good episode, though. That was a brilliant yeah. episode. And in light of everything that's going on, yeah, Happy yes. Warriors. Check that one out, guys. <laughs> now, it is not often I get to do what amounts to a sequel to a previous episode. But the similarities between this story and my tale back in episode 25 are too similar to not link them together in some way. If you would like a refresher, have a listen to Under the Radar and Goodness Gracious Great Bats of Fire. Go on, I'll wait. We'll wait. Okay, okay, you don't have to listen to my story about the project to create bat bombs, even though I totally (laughs) encourage you to do so. Bat bombs. Particularly since Susie has some Australian history tucked in there as well. It was, it was great. Yes. (laughs) But now onto this episode. Oh. Okay, I've got to pronounce this right. Sorry. Burhus. Frederick Skinner, more commonly referred to as B.F. Skinner, I wonder why, is most famous for the concept of the Skinner box, where he used rats and pigeons to prove his theories about using rewards to reinforce behaviour. This experiment also led to one of the more what the inventions of the 1940s. In the midst of World War II, the American military was looking for ways to improve the accuracy of missiles when it came to bombing Nazi targets on land and at sea. Yay! In 1943, Skinner, who had already trained pigeons to pack up levers through his Skinner box experiments, he was on a train and he noticed a flock of birds flying through the sky, keeping a near-perfect formation. Later, he would say, quote, Suddenly I saw them as devices with excellent vision and extraordinary manoeuvrability. Could they not guard a missile? Was the answer to the problem waiting for me in my own backyard? End quote. With these pigeons, friends. <laughs> what was the answer, you ask? Skinner developed a special missile nose cone with three windows where up to three pigeons could be placed inside. The pigeons would then be conditioned to peck towards an intended target. Harnesses inside the nose cone were attached to rods and pulleys that would steer the missile in the direction of the pecking, allowing the pigeons to guide a missile to a target. Yes, B.F. Skinner created the pigeon-guided missile. (laughs) Initially, the US military was a little reluctant to entrust its explosive ordnance to pigeons and did not take Skinner seriously. Skinner approached the National Research Defence Committee, who, while still being sceptical, decided to give him a chance and provided $25,000, which is approximately $321,000 in today's money. Uh, They provided that to him for further development. So Project Pigeon was born. Despite proving the accuracy of his cooing weapon of destruction in a series of successful simulations and tests, Skinner's military experiment was cancelled after 12 months, with the US government deciding the cost to produce weapons with pigeon-guided warheads was too great. So in 1944, Skinner had to pack up his pigeons and go home. (laughs) You would think that would be the end of it. But just four years later, in 1948, the US Navy resurrected the experiment under the title Project Orcon, which stood for Organic Control. The idea was, again, to improve the accuracy of missiles. The Navy spent five years fine-tuning the pigeon-powered guidance system, to the point of creating conductive glass panels for the pigeons to peck at with metal tips placed on their beaks, which greatly increased the accuracy. Ultimately, improvements in electronic systems proved to be more reliable, and the operation was shut down. To the relief of the pigeons. Mm, Well, it appeared the pigeons would be able to return to their busy lives of cooing in public places and trying to attract humans who had spare breadcrumbs. (laughs) At least until 1979, (laughs) when the US Navy and Coast Guard teamed up and instigated Project Sea Hunt. Since pigeons have an 80-degree angle of vision, and their small brains mean they can process visual information faster than humans, they are once again called into service for a much less destructive reason. Teams of three pigeons were trained to recognise orange life vests to aid in sea rescues and pack a sensor when they spotted one. In 89 test missions, the pigeons spotted the target quicker than the human observers 90% of the time. Uh Unfortunately, in the one real-life rescue mission, 
the helicopter the pigeons were helping to guide ran out of fuel on the second day. While the human occupants survived, the three avian heroes were sadly lost at sea. Hmm. Again, improvements in technology ultimately surpassed the pigeons' abilities, and Project Sea Hunt was scrapped in 1983. So I'd suggest people be nice to pigeons. They may no longer be guiding explosive weapons, but I'm sure they can still be pretty accurate with their own more organic bombs, and would be willing to use them to remind you of their place in what the history. <laughs> I cannot believe how long it went for. Oh, gosh. I, just thought this was I don't this... know if I should be laughing or not, but I was like, it's funny. This was one of those ones like, I, I didn't knew about the initial B.F. Skinner experiments, but the more I, I got to the end of that bit, and they're saying, hang on, what's this about Project Orquan? What? And then it was like, hey, what's this about Project Sea Hunt? How are they still using pigeons for these things? Mm -hmm. Well, that's like how it was with um, the 1938 World Cup story I just read out. Um, There was just that one little bit of information that you gave me about um, Austria being Mm -hmm. annexed by Germany in 1938, but um, which forced them out of the World Cup. But then I looked into the World Cup itself, and there was heaps of other strange stuff that went on there and you know during that time as well and mm. <laughs> it just went, went on and on and on yeah <laughs> and this is the great joy <laughs> of what the history oh god it is it's so if you would like more information and to dig even deeper we do have all our references linked in the podcast description down below mm-hmm. if you're watching this on youtube there's a link to the podcast page where you will find all those links there. Uh, if you want to get in touch with us, and we would love you to, uh, you can find us at our homepage, which is wthpod.rufusproject.com. You can send us an email to wthpod at rufusproject.com. You can find the What the History podcast page on Facebook or find pod underscore what on Twitter or use the hashtag wthpod. So we give you lots of ways to get in touch with us, and of course, please like share subscribe rate review all that stuff that all the other podcasters normally nag you about i'm going to mention it quickly nagging over (laughs) yes yes indeed absolutely and yes we hear it what the history like we said before do not like nazis i can't say what i want to say without putting in the bleep that's why i'm not Bleeping. Yes. <laughs> anyway. I'm not bleeping. On that, no bleeping here. <laughs> on that note, Bleep. I think it's time to wrap things <laughs> up. We will be back in a couple of weeks' time with two more bizarre bits of history to make you say, What, what the, the history. history. Good night, everyone. Farewell. It's me doing a pigeon every day. Oh boy, is that exciting? Seriously, Nazis. Nazis.